Yo. What up, though? I got to talk. I got to tell what I feel. I got to talk about my life as I see it. All right, then. It's time for you to bring it to the table. Turn up your radio wherever uh-huh. you at. We about to bring it. Street Yeah. With Tony B. For the next hour, Tony B will give you a chance to tackle local, national, and international issues that affect your community. Street B. Street B. Tony. Welcome to Street Beat. It's me, your host, Tony B. Street Beat is the show that keeps you in touch with the beat of the city, and we are continuing to follow uh, these issues surrounding the Seattle King County chapter of the NAACP. Um, Joining me for this program will be Sadiqa Sakin, the president, the current president of the NAACP, and uh, we are going to uh, discuss uh, again, if if you have if you're joining this conversation for the first time and you're wondering uh, why we are having this conversation and and what are these things that are taking place, uh, I don't have the time to go through all of that, unfortunately, um, uh, because we've got a lot to talk about. But what you can do is you can go to our Facebook page and uh, you can see, uh, you know, at least in regards to what's been discussed on this program, uh, what has taken place. And um, uh, the other thing is that if you are now interested in what is taking place here and you are saying to yourself, um, you know, the NAACP, this has my interest, um, then that's, again, why we are here right now. This is an organization, this is an entity um, that in Seattle began in 1913. I think it was 1906 when it first got started, but anybody can easily Google that. And uh, what does the NAACP stand for? If you are uh, someone who does not historically, um, are you that is not familiar historically with the role that the NAACP has played in the history of this country, um, if you are not some, if you are someone who just doesn't know what if you, what the NAACP has done, if you're someone who thinks that um, what they did then, all of those years, is something different than they should be doing now, then this is why you should be concerned about what's taking place. Or as I said, it, um, you know, in the way, what the hell is going on with you know CP? What what's going on? Um, so backtrack to some of those previous shows and you can get that information and find out some things, uh, what allegations were made. I'm going to start again with today. Joining me, um, will be Sadiqa Sakin and she's joining me over the phone, uh, because at our last conversation, uh, when, uh, we exited the building, um, there was feces on her car. I don't remember seeing that there. Uh, when she uh, when I when we came in the building when I let her in, and um, uh, I took pictures of it, so um, it was definitely there when we were out. And so, um, and I'll let her explain to you why. You know, beyond that, she has chosen that she would you know rather have this discussion today on the phone um, than in person. Having said that, um, Sadika, welcome to Street Beat. Thank you for having me. Um, well, uh, you know, I guess the first thing that I want to do is, is start with that. And, and I think, you know, uh, at, at least at this point, you know, um, if there is anything that like that you would like to say in that regard uh, about the last time that you were on the show, you know, we, we can talk about what we talked about as well. There's some, you know, we didn't quite finish, but um, what, what happened uh, to your vehicle uh, again, after um, uh, after the show was over. So a former disgruntled board member, Abin Bola, burst, burst into the radio station when we were interviewing us. When we were ending the, um, the interview, he, um, you, you expressed that he needed to leave on several occasions. Um, he finally left. And we decided to walk outside. He was already gone. And we realized there was feces on the car. And so, um, like you said, there was no feces on the car prior to me pulling up. You said that has not happened ever 
since you've been there, anything like that. So it is led to believe that Mr. Abengola, uh vandalized the car. There is a police report um, in the process, and there is a detective looking at it now. So those are all facts. Okay, and um, just to be, because I don't, I'm not denying, you know, all of those things happen. I just want to make sure that I, I do not know, you know, what happened outside of the fact that when we uh, went out to the car, um, <clears throat> what I described happened. I don't know who did what. I don't know uh, because I didn't see anything. And so, um, um you know, I'm, if I, I think that that kind of interjects me into the story, but I don't want to be interjected into the story. But from from where I sit, um, I just want to be clear about that. Is that again? You know, a, after the show was over, uh, Aben Bola came in. Uh, at the time, I, I called him Bola. Um, uh, he initially, uh, I asked him. I said, um, uh, "This is Bola." Who? Uh, and you can go back and see all of this. Some of it you won't be able to hear because um, Bola did not have uh, a microphone. And there was a microphone uh, in front of Miss Keene, and there was a microphone that I had. Uh, so what you didn't hear, which you can hear faintly, is Bola comes in, and I say, hey, this is Bola the gentleman, you know, who we were talking about earlier, and greeted him, and he asked me if he could be on the radio show. And I said, the show is almost over. And um, uh, then... Bola uh, yelled uh, at Sadiqa, um, you're a liar, something to the effect of you owe me money. Um, uh, from there, you can hear what Miss Keene says. Uh, I told Mr. Uh, I told Bola, I said, and you can pretty much hear this pretty clear, don't, don't do this on my show, very sternly. Um, he, you know, uh, threw his hands up in the air and he apologized and he said, I'm sorry, and he left very quickly. And um, after the show, uh, I don't I, recall him apologizing, but okay. Um, he he apologized. He apologized to me. Um, and um, uh -huh. he, he apologized to me. He said, he said, he looked at me and said, sorry. And, and, and left. Uh, and I acknowledged that. And, um, <clears throat> and then after um, uh, we walked out to the car, and um, and then again, I was as shocked as you were to see what was on the car. But again, that's just because I was kind of interjected into that. I wanted to make sure that that's my perspective on what happened. And, and again, anyone can go back and look at the tape. Um, but no question that there was feces on the car. And so um, just to explain that, you know, to start with, before we get into some other things, um, can you describe from your perspective what this experience has, you know, been like for you? Um, and we'll get into the allegations and the things that are going on. Uh, but thus far, since that's what we were talking about, um, since you can't be here today, what, what is what is the impact that you are feeling about now being president of the NAACP and uh, all of the things that have been going on that have led to uh, you potentially feeling unsafe in the environments where you want to be? So um, I feel like um, we came in to um, bring more visibility to the organization and um, bring about transparency. And that's what we've been doing. And it has um, stirred up a bunch of um, questions, concerns, dislikes, smearing, um, and personal attacks. And so my experience is... Um, I'd anticipate to be this tough, but um, it is. Um, but I'm still setting the course because, you know, um, I when I ran, this is what I ran to clean up and to, to make change. And so I'm steadfast on that. That's not changing. It's unfortunate that um, there are people out there that disagree with um, the way that I'm running the organization now. Um, I feel when they had their chance, to do it, they did it the way they felt to do it, and now it's my turn to run the organization as the president, and I feel it's very disrespectful that it's a continuation of past presidents trying to circumvent themselves and micromanage how I'm running the organization now. Um, we are following the bylaws and protocol, we are following the Constitution, and I think it's just 
It's blatant disrespectful and it's unfair and it's a little misogynistic because these are men trying to tell me how they think I should do things and when I'm not doing it the way they think I should do it, then this is the retaliation for the smear campaign. And that's how I take that. Um, but I'm steering the course and um, this isn't the first obstacle in my life that I've had to um, overcome and it won't be the last. And so um, that's my mindset. I think it was built for this. And I'm going to continue to do the work, and we're going to continue to move the, the organization forward. And now that all this is coming out, you know, I can say thank you for bringing more visibility to the organization. So when I actually leave, it's an eye on the organization, and they can never do what they did before again. And so that's the benefit and the plus of it. So thank you, brothers. That's what I want to say. You're, uh, you're listening to Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. It's me, your host, Tony B, right here on Street Beat. We are talking about uh, what the hell is going on at the NAACP. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going to also, uh, again, talk about some of the allegations that um, uh, are against you personally, against the organization, the things that have happened, and then uh, but I do want to talk about um, an event that I attended uh, that some of you may have seen, which, again, you can go back and watch. Um, and all I simply did was hold up a, a camera and, and sat in on a board meeting that was also a membership meeting. You can decide for yourself what it was. You can watch it and figure out. But uh, it was very contentious, and there were a lot of issues that were raised. Uh, again, and, and as as members of the community, I think that these should be things that you should be concerned about uh, regarding the NAACP and, um, you know, how this organization is being represented and, you know, what this organization was uh, and what it could be. And so just, again, making you uh, aware. So talking about that meeting, um, that I went to, my understanding, it was a membership meeting, and the issue that started off, uh, you know, at least from what I saw, that created change in there, and ultimately when we were talking about process was the selection of someone to run an act so program. And um, the, the concern at the meeting um, was uh, whether this individual um, was you know what were the what were the things that were done to make sure that this individual uh, was prepared to hold a position where there had been a question a fiduciary question about money having been there having not been there and we'll go into that and you can go into that if you want to um, but that was one of the questions that had arisen about fiduciary responsibility, which is what we had talked before about this Axel program and the placement of a person in that position, um, you know, and uh, to the questioning did not seem as though they were either prepared for the questioning, um, and maybe there could have been a number of circumstances about it. But um, let, let's start with that and the meeting in general. Uh, um, but if you want to, yeah, you know, start with like, that. I would like to speak to that. So like I expressed to you on the last show, um, when we originally got the branch, when I originally took over, it was brought to my attention that there was no actual account. And that the actual chair from the past administration um, had to act have funds in her personal account that was supposed to be for access. After I found out later on that that was funds that was um, um, loaned to Axel from the branch. So I say that to say that that's how, that's how we first started off with action. So then I put in position, I um, appointed someone to take over the action. And they started to run it with the co-chair. So it's two people that were in the action program. And the past action um, person, chairperson, was asked to support whatever, however that looked. Now, are, are you, are you... I'm sorry, are you as the president, according to governance and bylaws, do, do you have the, the sole authority to place someone in that type of position? Is this something that has Absolutely. to be? Yes, y yes you yes. do. It's not something you that has to be voted on by the board. It, it can be at your sole discretion. So, no, it's not sole discretion. So if, there, if a seat, a position is in field, according to our constitution and bylaws, the president is to appoint the person to that position. So the, uh, when we ran the election, no one ran for Axel. So 
after was a vacant position. And so our current vice president, who ran after the prior administration, she did not run for the actual chair. So that seat was vacant. And so when we got wind of the um, commingling of the funds, I thought it wouldn't be wise, being that we weren't ready to start an audit, to put that person back in that position. It just wouldn't be smart. So what I did was I appointed two people to co-chair that actual chair. So keep in mind, there was no account. So now we have an account. So then once we found out all this and discovered, cleaned it up, then we decided to um, get a cap just for Axel. And that account for Seattle Team Problem, Axel. It doesn't have anyone's name on it. So whoever is the chair at that time is appointed, but they have to, um, whatever they have to do, it has to be um, according to what the bylaws and constitution or how the account is supposed to be. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to stop so, you just there, there for one second. Uh, for those of you who are listening, we are having a very in-depth conversation here. So, if, so those of you listening on AXO and 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 distribution of funds and and what is this stuff? Yes, again, this is important information. Now, the reason why I think that this one stood out was could, was is because this is a program that supports youth, it supports children. Correct. One of the accusations Correct. that was made was that this program that had money in it, funds of I think I, I'm not exactly sure, uh, and I don't have it in front of me, but funds that were appropriated specifically for this entity, those funds were removed, taken out, there was no real record of it, and and this is where we are with it right now. And and if you could maybe just give a brief explanation of what so, AXO is and so, the acronym. So, AXO is a, it's a program, it's like the Olympics of the mind, and for the children. So you When you were when you happened. when you took office, there was no money designated in place specifically for AXO. Correct. There was no bank account either. So all of that stuff is not true. None of it is true. Okay, tell so us a little bit about AXO, AXO, and we can go back to the details. But just tell folks what AXO is, so that they know what we're talking about. So AXO is a program that is it's the Olympics of the mind. Uh, <coughs> it is a program that is um, set up for, um, so AXO STEM, let me just tell you what it stands for. It is the AXO Academic Culture Technology Scientific Olympics. So it is, um, it's Olympics of the mind. So it's a program in which kids, um, they compete in various areas and they compete for scholarships, and um, awards, and it's a once a year program. You go to national from all around the country, so there's 22 branches. I don't know how many actual branches there are, but all the kids come together for um, a competition, and then you know they get medals, um, awards, and it's a way to highlight them for scholarships for college. So that's basically what actual is. Okay, and I and I bring that up because this is this is what we're talking about. But besides the fiduciary part about it. Um, you know, there is another part about it. Is this what this program is for and what it does? And in 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 that regard, for you, um, with this, uh, with, tell me your feelings about the Axel program and and where you think it stands in relevance to the representation of the NAACP, and it's in and, and it's it's I guess importance to the community. Well, I think it's a very important um, program. It uh, helps to build self-confidence for children. Um, it actually highlights skills, and it helps propel them to the future. I feel as though, it, you know, I've heard so many amazing stories from past ACTO participants, how um, because of that in itself, it has propelled them in their career. So I think it's an amazing uh, program, and um, I'm excited that we have one in this branch. And at this point in time, um, again, this is what the meeting was about. 
Um, do you feel uh, as president that uh, moving forward, because I think this was part of the big question here, that the program is moving forward in the way that's, you know, it, it's being respected, appreciated, put in motion to grow and definitely be something that can be sustainable. Do you think that at this point it's been given that necessary attention and then it's moving in that direction? So, yes, it does. So keep in mind, a couple of months ago, the chair that we had is actually she resigned. And so we have a new chair. So the sister that is the new chair has only been there one month. And so there's a transition process. So she's still getting the transitional documentation from the past uh, chair. So with respect to that, I felt that the people that came to the meeting and was personally attacking her, it was just unfair. It was rude and it was very disrespectful to treat an elder like that, first and foremost. And so my thing is, if you've only been in position for one month, you are still getting the information. You are still uh, processing everything. And my thing is, instead of attacking her, how about you come with solutions on how you can support her? Like the gentleman who stood up in the back and said, you know what, sister, I, you know, this is counterproductive. How these people are talking to you. It's very disrespectful as you as an elder. How can I help you, sister? And he got up and he gave his card. And this brother, you know, he's, uh, he runs like a chamber of commerce dealing with uh, helping black businesses. And so that's what we're supposed to do. And so a lot of people that were standing up asking those questions were, um, a part of the committee of acts of prior. There were there were there were definitely a lot of opinions. There were definitely a lot of opinions at the end. And again, people can go back and watch it. And and you certainly have the room to. But essentially, again, what I'm getting at is at, at this point in time, that's one of the. Do you think that you know? At, that you are positioning AXO so it could be fiduci it can be financially strong and sustainable. Are you comfortable with the direction? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. And the so other. Right now we have nine thousand close to ten thousand dollars in that AXO account, mm -hmm. which is designated to AXO. So once more, AXO mm -hmm. has its own bank account. AXO has nine thousand and something, almost ten thousand dollars in it, and Seattle Credit Union has partnered up with. Seattle King County NAACP, and they will be giving a scholarship to one child in the name of Jackie Jones Walsh, who is one of our past board members who passed away this year. It's a scholarship for $5,000. And so that is something also that is added to Axel. So, yes, Axel is growing, and Axel is, um, is a program that is potentially growing into something bigger than it was before. So, okay. yes. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna move on unless you wanna you know because you, you know we got a bunch of other stuff to talk about. No, that's it. Uh, um, so I'm the only last thing I'm gonna bring up from the the meeting, uh, and this was brought up before again, and I'm gonna give you the opportunity to clarify here, um, is the issue of stipends, and and uh, stipends given to uh, board members, and how that aligns with governance, and if there was any governance that that has changed. Um, to my knowledge, which I may not have it all historically, um, stipends have never been given to board members or past presidents. Um, now, I, I believe that you are getting a stipend and board members are getting stipends. And if this is something um, that is a direction that is necessary for uh, the NAACP to move towards uh, or whatever it is that people feel like there needs to be an explanation for about why this is happening uh, and how it got to this point. If it was ever in the bylaws that this was never supposed to happen and the bylaws were changed and, and voted on by a new board, whatever it is, um, can you just kind of clarify that from what I'm asking about the stipends that were never there, but now they're there and people are taking, taking stipends and getting okay. gas money or whatever. So once more, none of that is true. There are no one, no one on the board is getting a stipend. The president has a stipend only. No one else is getting a stipend, so that isn't true. So that's 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 a lie. It's not a misrepresentation. It's a lie. So the only stipend that is besides designated is the president's stipend. And like I expressed the last time, that it's there in the event that it's needed. So it's not used if it's not needed. It isn't a guarantee amount of money every. It's a guarantee amount of money, but it isn't used every single month. It's rolled over. So like right now, I'm grant writing. So the majority of the majority of the time, I am at home on my computer grant writing. So I'm not driving, going 
going downtown or going anywhere and parking and all that. So that money is just sitting in the account because I don't need it. It's only when I'm out and about doing things representing the NAACP, gas, et cetera, parking, et cetera. So once more, no one else has a stipend. A stipend is designated in an account that is not touched unless it's needed. And all documentation to support it is there. And so this thing that's going uh, that this, this thing that's going around on Facebook uh, that I believe came from Carl Mack that shows I think it's about sixty seven hundred dollars uh, in in charges um, that it's were used for um, or, or or that you used for various driving yeah. and to repay yourself. Um, uh, yeah, it's a lie. That's what it is. It's a lie. It's a way to create a narrative of something that isn't the case. And once more, like I expressed to the, the brother, in the event he wanted any of this information prior to doing the um, the gaslighting and all of the foolishness that he's doing on social media, he was more than welcome to reach out to us and he was given given this information. He chose to go this route, so it is what it is, but it isn't what he's saying. Whoever's giving him this information, it's not true. So this the sixties. I don't remember exactly. It was over six thousand um, dollars. That's money that was never allocated to you. That you never received. That was never voted on by the board. That just is completely non-existent. Doesn't no. There, it, there's. It came out of nowhere. That's a lie. You're listening to Rainier Avenue Radio Street Beat. It's me, your host, Tony B. Uh, we are talking about issues impacting and affecting the Seattle King County chapter of the NAACP. Uh, my guest joining me is Sadika Sakin, current president of the NAACP. Uh, this is a live show. So, Sadika, excuse me for, for one second, because I meant to do something at the beginning of the show. But since we're talking about a historical, uh, a historical organization, I just have to take a second, uh, you know, to say uh, in remembrance of, of John Witherspoon, um, who is a, an iconic comedian um, in the black community and for everyone, I know that uh, I know this is a weird place to interrupt, but it just came up on, you know, I remember, you know, initially uh, in Boomerang. And but then I remembered, oh, that was the guy in Hollywood Shuffle. And then, of course, you know, every, he was a, uh, the NAACP recipient, the recipient, the brother was. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, he was and, yes. And uh, and some of you may remember him from Friday. And of course. Uh, you know, he taught he taught the the, the black community how to coordinate <laughs> uh, in uh, in Boomerang, and then of course Grandpa in Boondocks. And so, just in case we ran out of time later, I wanted to make sure that I I got that in since uh, an iconic member of the, um, the comedic community and the black community has passed away. So rest in peace, John Weatherspoon. Okay, now back. Uh, to what we were talking about. Uh, it's not a train wreck. We're talking about black things. These things go together. doesn't matter what they are. Um, getting back to, again, um, the issues impacting and affecting the NAACP, NAACP and, again, addressing um, the allegations um, that were made that, uh, again, I want to focus on um, the process um, so can you tell me um, what the board changeover has been since you've been president and, and why uh, for you that board changeover has, had, has taken place? When you say board changeover, what board you members mean? leaving, are you board members. The new people that were elected? Yes. The, saying, the, saying I'm saying board, board members that have left and board members that have come on. You know, it, it, I mean, you, it, what I'm saying is th there's, is there no difference? Maybe there's a difference. Is this in mind? Is there, explain to us, you know, maybe this is a change of guard. Maybe this is a change of thought. You know, maybe these are board members with a different direction in mind. Maybe this was whatever it was. Can you explain the difference or is there a difference and why there is a difference in the board members that are not there anymore and the board members that are there today and how they got on the board? So um, initially when I took office, pretty much the 
um, the only people that were a part of the board were the ones who ran, which was myself, um, the first, second, and third vice like president, the secretary, assistant secretary, the treasurer, and then it was two at large people or three that ran. And so that was the only people. So all the positions, like the legal redress, labor, accountability, um, those positions were not filled. And so um, I went out and interviewed people, myself and others, went out to interview people to um, see if they were a fit for the board, if they were interested in serving. And so needless to say, when I came on, when we started, um, our first meeting was the 14th of January. I appointed people and then we voted and so on and so forth. It's a full board. Um, so currently, as we started um, the audit and uh, things started getting really, because a lot of some of the people that were named in the audit were people um, that are, you know, in the community. So it's a sensitive subject. A lot of it is very sensitive. And so there were people that were not. Um, you know, there was pushback, there was a lot of um, concern and different things. There's only so much I can discuss, being that that was in um, closed meeting. But we was to say, um, people were not um, happy with the direction that we decided to take with turning over the audit, turning over it to the investigators. And so people chose to um, resign because there was a lot of pushback and there was some infighting. And then people were removed because of infractions that they did. And so not one infraction, but multiple infractions. And so uh, people in question, like um, the legal redress was removed, the labor chair was removed, and the police accountability chair was removed. So what, removed, what is that What is that uh, removal that process? Is, large, that, is right. that something that is the vote? Is this something that people meet about and vote on? Is this something yes. that the president has the authority to do, you know, just as as president? Um, so people and, and is there a any kind of you know uh, appeal process and and were all of yes. those things yes. done? Yes, there are. Yes. And does so that need to be reported to the national that. chapter at all, or or it's all independently yes. run by local? So basically, what happens is. Um, there is an investigation when there's an infraction, there's an investigation that is done. Um, and it consists of the executive committee and the parliamentarian, the governance committee. And so what they do is they discuss whatever has transpired. They give the person the opportunity to speak to why their transgression or what they have done. So it's pretty much kind of like a hearing. And then after that, a decision is made. Um, the transgressions are documented and they're brought up to the court, and then a vote is made. And so each time, the three that were removed were because of the transgressions that they did. And so it wasn't one, it was multiple. Um, and so they were removed according to the bylaws and the Constitution that we have. And so it, it wasn't a decision on me. I don't make that decision. And so everything um, is a, it's a team. We make the decision together. And so something is brought up to the board, it's discussed, and we bring out the Constitution and the bylaws, the why. And if it's something that's detrimental to the branch itself, then the, that is grounds for removal. And then that information is documented, it's recorded, and it is sent off. And so it, that's the process for removing someone from the board. And uh, again, well, my my guest is Sadiqa Sadin, the current president of the NAACP. Uh, we're talking about uh, challenges, accusations, denials, um, things uh, that are bringing into question, um, some would say, the validity uh, of the NAACP. And um, um, so we are having this conversation. And um, yes, yeah, so you can certainly, you know, I'm just again giving some background on, on for anyone who may be tuning in right now uh, or, or who has just joined the conversation. Some of the things that we're talking about are, are very specific. Again, if you're looking to get more details, I mean, there's four hours worth of things that you can go back and listen to if you go to RainierAvenueRadio.world and hear some of the discussions that took place. We uh, make sure that we have open, honest, frank discussion and 
um, at least at this radio station, then, you know, if you want your voice to be heard, your voice will be heard unless you come into my show at, with two minutes left. Um, so I'm sorry, Sadiqa, you wanted to say something? Yeah, so the, the, the process of removing is the governance committee. And so the, the governance committee consists of the executive board. So there are committee chairs, and then there's an executive board. The executive board is the president, the three vice chairs, the secretary, the assistant secretary, the treasurer, the assistant sec uh, treasurer, and the at-large. That is the executive committee. So the governance committee is pretty much made up of those people. And then when there is an infraction, a multiple infraction, once a hearing is done, the person speaks what they felt, why they did what they did, and then it's returned, and the decision is made, it is a vote. So it isn't one person that removes anybody. And so the three that we remove, let's be clear, the executive committee, which includes my my vice chair, my treasurer, my secretary, and at large, voted to have them removed. So I didn't have a vote for that. So we're clear. They were removed by the governance committee because the infractions were detrimental to the branch. And that's what the parliamentarian is for, to read up the Constitution and what it states why, how they are removed. So nothing is done by me saying, okay, I don't want this person here anymore. you got to go. That's not how this works at all. And so let's be clear. The governance committee is who removed the, the, the three chairs that was removed that committed the infraction. And it was multiple infractions. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to move on to something else, unless there's something else you want to say about that. Okay. Um, th there have also, you know, again, um, been accusations against your personal credibility, and I, I um, and they relate because it's part of the overall picture of uh, that's either being painted or, uh, um, you know, that some people are alleging is true. And um, but before we do that, because that gets in, may get into a whole nother, then I want to give you certainly the opportunity to respond. Um, but while we're talking about the NAACP specifically, can you share um, with our audience your your vision, you know, kind of succinctly, but, you know, maybe one year, three year, um, w what you would like to see and where you would like to see the NAACP and the types of things you'd like to see the NAACP engaged in and evolved in so that people can get an idea of what they should expect from Seattle King County chapter of the NAACP. So um, when I ran around the platform of bringing more transparency, visibility, and bringing us into the 21st century. And so the things that I've been working on for starters is um, putting together, making sure the infrastructure and systems are in place. Um, I have a team that's working on for the finances to so make sure our finances are in place. So we have internal control moving forward. Everything is documented. Um, in regards to the system and um, with the processes of um, the people, the clients that come in, I want to make sure that we have an uh, accurate database that's set up to where each client has a case number and there's a follow-up after 90 days. And we are making sure that we're making those clients whole. So that's some of the other things that we're doing. Um, like I expressed before, the reality is we can't just, um, you know, march in front of a store and protest. That's great and all, but we have to do a little bit more. So we're going to need um, someone to monitor what's going on on the state level, the local level, and the city, state, and um, county. And that's the laws that are coming down to make sure that they are in alignment with um, the mission of the organization, which is to protect, um, so, you know, full of, of the citizens, people of color. So that's another thing. Um, putting together databases for volunteers, and so when people come in and volunteer, they're, um, the, the, the amount of time that they're putting in is documented. Well, documented before when we're soliciting for securing funds, we can um, put that in to say this is how much time it takes for this particular type of task. At some point, um, I feel that we need to hire an administrator to support and make sure that everything is, uh, the cases and everything is processing and running smoothly. So, um, 
those are some of the things that I want to do and partner up, which we have been doing. So a lot of the things that, the platform that I ran on, we were pretty much doing it. And so I had a published report that I put out, and it was basically um, saying all of the things that we were doing, the partnerships with other organizations, collaborations, putting together the databases, putting systems in place. Um, and so that's pretty much what we've been doing. Um, I've even put together, um, I've allotted all of the knowledge and different things like that. And so that's to put into the database that we're putting together for the volunteerism. And so it tells how many, how many drives that I did, um, the knowledge that I did, how many meetings that I went to. And all of that is for the volunteerism database. And so that's put in there. So then when my board members and I are looking to secure some sort of funding for the branch, we can say how many volunteer hours were put in, how many mileage, and different things like that. And so that's the things that we've been working on. And we're still working now. Like right now we're working on um, Respirator 88, which is bringing affirmative action back. So even though all of this is going on, all of the uh, foolishness on social media, the smear campaign, we're still working behind the scenes and getting things done. We're still doing the work. Um, and getting out to vote, the census, we're still going to meetings, we're still doing everything that we're supposed to do. Um, and we're still supporting other organizations and community events. So check out our social media pages, check us out on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you can see what we're still doing. We're still doing the work, even in all the this that's going on. Traditionally, folks have reached out to the NAACP because they're in a stressful situation. Um, what are the types of things, and, and you know, it, it could be other things, and you're free to tell me whatever, but traditionally, uh, folks have reached out to the NAACP under, under duress. Um, with the, you know, current changes uh, in federal policies and the societal times, you, you have certain groups that are feeling under duress for a number of different reasons. Um, maybe marginalized, maybe like they have nowhere to go. And in particular, um, in a black community uh, that is not centralized, um, what are the things that you would say as the NAACP that are important to you right now uh, that you would say, these are the reasons why we're here and this is in contact the NAACP if these particular things are issues that are concerning you in your community? Well, first and foremost, this legislative season that uh, we went through, which was from, I guess it started January through March, we looked at close to 60 different cases that could potentially hurt communities of color. And so we were there testifying and following those bills and tracking them to make sure that um, they didn't get passed. A lot of them were in housing, education, um, some of the laws is um, employment, different things like that. So these are some of the things that we have to keep an eye on. I mean, we can protest in front of a store. We can also picket something or rally. But at the end of the day, you know, if you don't pay attention to the bills that are coming down in the policy and make sure that we put a stop to that or we have a voice, we're at the table, then it's, it, it, you know, um, it, it's kind of like it's going to trickle down and, you know, it's only so much um, time and energy you can put in a rally and protesting as opposed to stopping the bill and track. At, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't so much mean protesting, and it might be that as well, and there are certainly bills, but I mean to someone who is listening right now who's, who is going through, uh, again, you know there are a number of different things that I could name, but people who are going through things individually, personally, are feeling like, they, they need to know that there is an entity out there that, that wants to hear about what they are going through, what that particular struggle is. Again, the NAACP, most people are familiar with it because they're experiencing some sort of stress. What are those or some of those specific things that you want to let community members know? Um, contact the NAACP. If these, is, you know, it, yeah, what, what, what are those things in particular? Um, that I, I don't know what you, you want to call them, but if these things are happening, if you are experiencing this, if uh, whatever, what are those things that, that you want to make sure that the community knows that you will continue to be there to support and be a stable um, and a sustainable entity for? So if you're feeling like you're 
like you're being discriminated against in your workplace, um, in your employment, or if you're feeling like you're being overlooked in, um, at school or in, uh, in your housing, reach out to us. We have cases now that we're working on. So it isn't like we're not. We're doing that now. So we still have people that are calling in and um, we are supporting right now. Uh, so it's pretty much if you're feeling like you're being mistreated or ignored or um, discriminated, you reach out to the NAACP. And that's, that's how it's been always. They reach out, they call us, or they, um, they submit a case online. So um, we're still doing that work. And people know that they can still reach out to us. And we still have um, an ear to listen and support and advocate for them. So we're, we are still doing that now. Well, thank you uh, for sharing that information. And uh, again, so that, you know, again, this is this is your double in double in double ACP community. You should be. Can, um, can I ask something? Sure. Can I ask something to that? Mm -hmm. So we we are already getting cases of people that are hurting or in pain. And so it's counterproductive for uh, like Mr. Mack to do what he's doing when we're out here on the front lines fighting for civil rights. So we're fighting for civil rights and we're still putting fires out from uh, past people that feel that we're not going to do it. Instead of coming in and trying to support us with what we're trying to do, trying to tear down. And so it's counterproductive to, we're helping community, we're helping people taking cases on and supporting, doing the work, and then having to put a fire out in our own community because people are trying to sabotage the work that we're doing. And that's very counterproductive. So if it's really about community, as I'm hearing, it's about community and the NAACP, then support the NAACP and stop all of the infighting and the foolishness. I just wanted to add that. Cool. Um, and so now I'm going to move into the phase, like I said before, we still have some time because there have been uh, part of this were, you know, things that were levied specifically more personally uh, against you. And I'm going to start with, you know, uh, what led to um, the the events that led up to uh, Mr. Bola coming down to the radio station. I have not had a chance to discuss with him um why or the details or, or whatever, but I know that we talked about uh, on that show whether or not um, he was placed on the board um, because of a $5,000, and then it came into question whether it was a, a donation or a loan. And again, folks can go back and, and watch so I'm or listen to it, and I, uh, I tried to clarify whether that was a donation or a loan, and if there, if there was anything that said that there was something signed, um, and uh, you know, you told me that it was a donation, and I said, was there anything signed that said it was a loan? And there wasn't a clear answer on that. Um, Mr. Bola came down, and one of the things again that he yelled, however inappropriate it is to break in on the show, was that you know you're lying. That was a loan. You owe me money. And then uh, something surfaced again on Facebook that was part of a text where it looked apparently as though it was a loan and that was there was some anticipation that it would be paid back, um, which again uh, just brings into the issue of, uh, you know, and so whether it was a loan or whether it's not a loan, I don't know whether that's something that's going to be decided by a civil court. Um, and so, you, you know, that, that I don't know, but, but if there is some clarity that, that you can bring to that, you know, for the people who are listening, um, right now, uh, about that point of reference, your, whether it was a, a donation to your campaign or whether it was a loan, Mr. Bola seems to think that it was a loan. So when we got into it before, there was the vandalism of the car. He burst in and all of that. So um, there is a court um, where we have a day in court on that. And so I'm going to leave it at that because um, at the end of the day, when the car was vandalized, I have to pay that. And now that there's a case, a uh, court, a uh, police are involved, I'm going to leave it at that for now. Okay. I'm not going to discuss it any further. 
Okay. Um, and uh, again, just bringing things up, and I appreciate you, you know, coming on. Um, uh, again, this, it's f- what was discussed previously was something that was on another show. And so moving forward at this point again, um, I guess it could move into some legal aspects. And so that's where we're at on that. And I'm going to move forward uh, again in another issue, uh, you know, that came up. Um, and you can certainly just put this to bed again. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that'll be the end of it. Uh, I, I don't have any documentation. Um, I haven't been given any documentation. I don't know that it is required of anyone. Um, I do know, and I think you know where I'm going with this, that fraternal and black fraternal and black sorority, uh, organizations are, are very serious. Uh, about entrance and into these organizations. Um, They play a significant role in the black community, often known as the divine nine. Um, There is a pledging process to be part of these organizations and these entities that um, is is secretive. It's, uh, It's a lot of different things. And the question has come up about whether you or you are are not a member of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority. And the last time we were on the show, you said that, yes, you were. And um, uh, again, I don't have any documentation uh, either way. Um, It has certainly come into question about whether you were able to provide that documentation to anyone, to my knowledge, you have not, not that you have to. Um, it could be a way that you could put this whole thing to bed. And um, so I will just ask you again, in that regard, can you clarify your position on this and why you have or have not chosen to follow up with documentation? Uh, and if you think it's necessary to prove that you are, because I'm going to assume at this point you are, because the last conversation I had with you, you said you were a member of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority, unless you are not a member? So, um, like I said before, it was not a requirement to um, disclose that when I ran. Um, like I said before, that um, I feel that it's a smear campaign, and when I'm ready to discuss that and show whatever proof I have, I will. But I'm not going to... Because I've seen things that have come up about that and my credit and bankruptcy and all this. And I'm not going to um, be put on trial in every single facet of my personal life or my life. I'm not going to do it. And so when I'm ready to discuss that, I will. Um, That is my business. And, I mean, that's what I'm going to leave it at. Like I I stated before, I feel that um, they have had engineers, they have had attorneys, they have had people that have been incarcerated, and no one is asked to look at their anything, their affiliations, their test scores, their blood types, uh, their uh, their um, transcripts, anything. And so I'm not going to um, be uh, subjected to something that everybody else wasn't. And so when I'm ready to disclose that, I will and put that out. But I don't, you know, um, I think that's where, I, that's where I'm going to leave it. And so, um, had it been more of a um, sister, a sisterly um, approach to come into me about that, then this would be different. And so, that, that's where I'm going to leave it at right now. Okay. Um, you're listening to Street Beat on Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. It's me, your host, Tony B. My guest again joining me, uh, Sadika Sakin current president of the NAACP. Again, we've been talking about a, a, a number of different things. Uh, the title of the show was, was what the hell is going on at the NAACP? And I hope that some uh, of what you've heard in over the course of these four discussions that we've had um, has helped you to discern something for yourself um, and how you feel. Um, uh, uh, again, uh, you know, at, at this point, you know, Sadika, 
what what do you say to everyone listening right now um everyone who will listen at some point um to give them the confidence who is hearing all of this information and some of it you may be considered to be misinformation what what do you say uh, to let folks who are going to depend on this organization as one that highly represents uh, the black community and all communities um, in the times that we are having right now, where again, there are communities in serious distress. Hate crimes are extremely high. Uh, folks are worried about getting deported. Um, you know, there are a ton of other issues that impact people on a, on a, on a smaller level, whether it be, you know, lack of housing or lack of food or education. What do you, what do you say with all of this stuff out there to the community that lets them know that you are the person to be in charge of the NAACP and they can trust in you and your ability to move this organization in a way that's going to be visionary in its ability to react to the needs of the communities. I am sitting that I'm the same person that ran and um, when I got elected in January, the visibility, the work, everything that we've been doing up to now, to which say four weeks ago when all of this started the smear campaign. I'm the same person that I was. And I'm still doing the work out here on a volunteer basis. I'm the same person, it's the same organization, and we're getting the work done. If, if it's about community, and it's really about community, then put up that other stuff aside, and let's start doing the work. Let's, let's stop with the, the gaslighting and the counterproductive behavior. If it's really about getting things done, use that platform to advocate for civil rights. If it's really about community, then you know what, push the rest of the media, which is a form of action, so we can actually get, you know, contact for communities of color. If it's really about community, and it's really about making a difference, and people are saying, then do the work. You know, volunteer somewhere. If you don't want to volunteer for the NAACP, volunteer somewhere else. But let's start doing the work, and stop all the side talking and conversations on all the other stuff. Yes. People are losing their houses. People are being incarcerated unfairly. You know, there is uh, various police brutality. There are so many things that are going on that we can be fighting and advocating for. And certain crabs in the barrel foolishness. They start doing the work. That's what I can say about that. I'm the same person that was from January, and I'm still doing the work. Thank and that's, you. that's what we're doing, the NAACP. We're still working. We're still supporting. We're still about community. We're still advocating for civil rights. We're still taking cases. We're still working on really big cases now that we're not speaking of now, but we're still doing the work. I'm 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 just yeah. about I'm just about out of time here, Sadika. Um, and and so thank you for joining me. And again, you know that you always have an opportunity uh, to share here on Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. Um, so uh, that's it. That's all the time I have. Fresh juice is coming yep. up next. Can I say something real quick? Yeah, 10 the seconds. The next time I come on, I want to be talking about some of the positive things that we're doing Wait, and you, some of the actions that we're doing to move forward with community. You That's always have, you always, no in, and, I, and I've made that offer to you before, and I appreciate you coming on under these circumstances, and I've made you right. continue to have that opportunity. So until Thank next you. time, you're welcome. Until next time, it's me, Tony B., your host of Street Beat, saying, remember, whether you believe you can or whether you believe you can't, you are probably right. I'm out. Peace. Would you like to see when your favorite Rainer Avenue Radio show comes on? Check out our show schedule, updated weekly at RainerAvenueRadio.world. This is your Rainer Avenue Radio.world community update on visiting Seattle area museums for free. Get your cultural fix on the cheap on first Thursdays. Free all day are the Birth Museum of Natural History and the Henry Art Gallery, both in the University District, the Nordic Heritage Museum in Ballard, the Seattle Art Museum downtown, the Wing Luke Asian Museum in the International District, the Northwest African American Museum in the Central District, and the Museum of History and Industry, Mohai, 
in South Lake Union. And free for Thursday evenings are the Museum of Flight at Boeing Field and the Living Computers Museum in Soto. Museums that are always free include the Center for Wooden Boats on South Lake Union, the Duwamish Longhouse in West Seattle, the Fry Art Museum on First Hill, the Klondike Gold Rush National Historic Park in Pioneer Square. Check with each museum for schedules and exhibits. This has been your Rainier Avenue Radio Dot World Community Update on visiting Seattle area museums for free. Hello everyone, I'm Mark Bryan. This is the Fitness Corner. My show is all about providing you with fitness tips, teaching you how to exercise in and out of the pub safely. If you have conditions of high blood pressure, diabetes, I will also be providing you tips on how to exercise and keep yourself healthy. There will be guests on my show talking about their fitness routines and how they stay healthy to continue their sport. And you can hear all of this and a 